Okay. Yes. And if you're not talking, we appreciate if you mute. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm just frantically trying to come up with the uh, uh, most suitable uh, English uh, version of my, uh, so I can uh, like that one. Yeah, uh, just a few seconds now. Um, so I just share my screen, right? Uh, okay, it says you disabled the uh, screen sharing. Oh, uh, sorry, my, I'll take care of that. Um, try it again. And you'll introduce him, of course. Okay, <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm then kind of ready. Okay, so why don't you give a quick introduction to yourself and we'll go into the talk. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Frode Linjera and I uh, just uh, published uh, the book on Operation Nidipa. Um So I will take you uh, through a short introduction that will uh, take you through the uh, the background of the story, the wider strategic picture, and um, the, the you know the kind of uh, highlights of the events, and we'll uh, I guess uh, do a talk afterwards. So if you can see my first slide now, uh, uh, this is um, um, you know. Um, the, the the context of the uh, operation Edipa was the uh, um, the f allied fear uh, that uh, troops extracted from Norway and Finland would be uh, sent as reinforcements to uh, uh, to the, uh, Germany in the final battles. So it was uh, an operation Edipa was just one of several similar operations against the Nordland Railroad. Um, there were about 700 minor attacks all around the country. Uh, and uh, also to, to this mix was added the, the, the German offensive in the Ardennes, uh, the so-called Battle of the Bulge. Uh, you can't see the of... slides. You can't see the slides. Okay. Uh, I, I can see the slides. You may have to minimize one of your screens and because you have three screens now and you might have to minimize them i have two monitors so it makes it a little easier but if yeah, you minimize I... them you should be able to see that All right now okay. it's there okay uh so you can see the uh my um, presentation or not yet oh. We seem to have Gene Addison screen. What? And I only have one uh, one screen. I don't have. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, we'll just take it. Uh, go through it then. Um, yes. Um, so the backdrop to this um, this. Uh, no. Or this happened happened to me the other day. Um, okay. Okay. So Bill has share screen, and then he's letting you use the new share screen. If you click on share screen, then there's another okay. share screen, and what comes up is is your files or okay. okay. But look to the right. There's options. And the options say share the video or something, maximize. There's two options there that need to be checked off. Um, it's, okay. Try that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in. I'm on basic now, so I just share this one. It's now visible or? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Fun. Yeah. Uh, I think I have had the same problem at, at another point. Yes, okay. Um, the Norso was 
um, parts or, or originally part of the uh, OSS uh, operations group because uh, when the OSS was established, it was, uh, you know, it was put together from scratch. So uh, they could learn um, a, a lot from uh, problems uh, that other great powers has run into regarding uh, um, divisional labor and turf wars, uh, especially between intelligence and special operations. And that was a huge problem in Britain uh, because there was constant um, you know, uh, conflicts between people dealing with uh, domestic security, people de dealing with um, mm. uh, overseas intelligence and uh, the SOE uh, dealing with the sabotage missions. So, uh, and the NORSA was part of uh, um, this operations group that was put, the, put together on ethnic, uh, uh, along ethnic lines. And, and the idea was to uh, kind of exploit their um, cultural savviness because, you know, they were, they would know the language, they would know the culture of uh, the uh, various, various countries in which they would operate. So this was a huge advantage for uh, United States uh, having a, a large, uh, large um, uh, immigration uh, immigrant population. Uh, so the Norwegian uh, operations group they were uh, you know um, trained alongside Greek, Italian, and uh, French groups. Um, the I. You know, uh, Norway wasn't kind of, you know, uh, wasn't an area where the Second World War would be decided. So they were uh, kind of, uh, uh, and, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, I deal a little bit with this in my book, that there, there was a lot of um, plans that didn't come through. For instance, Operation Barter, where they were planning to attack uh, a mining complex in the west of Norway in 1943. That didn't... Um, manifest itself because of um, the conflicts with the British uh, mainly on uh, on issues of um, of um, uh, logistics and transport. So instead they were uh, divided into small uh, teams uh, paired up with uh, French um, radio operators and parachuted into France in the so-called Jedburg operations to liaison uh, between uh, Allied invasion force and the French resistance. Uh, the op Allied operations in France were over quite quickly, uh, so the Norso was, you know, rather unemployed um, as autumn came. Uh, the, and, and this book uh, deals a lot with uh, Major Colby, um, who you may know as the, the director of the CIA in the 70s. Uh, he was um, kind of, um, in many ways, um, the archetypical uh, officer of the uh, OSS. He was an academic rather than a military person because a lot of, uh, there were very few professional um, uh, career officers in the OSS, they were mainly, you know, people being drafted, uh, a lot of uh, business, people from business, a lot of people from academia. Um, so they were, um, and he got into the game and was given uh, command over one of the uh, sections of Norso. Um, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, I also deal at length with the planning of the operation because I find that very interesting because I have also been, you know, uh, that also reflects kind of my own experiences in the military as a uh, uh, part of the, you know, the um, intelligence section of uh, military staff. And it, um, and it's also kind of um, uh, 
<laughs> let's say, uh, it shows you how much of the work that is done by military staff that really becomes uh, redundant once an operation gets going. Because they collected uh, intel about an area in which they weren't going to operate. Uh, so they were planning on operating against uh, bridges and tunnels much further north uh, from what they really did. Um, and there was a lot of um, uh, really good planning and the, the targets uh, they picked out was really, um, um, there were good targets. For instance, you would have uh, 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 places where the railroad was more or less blasted into the mountainside with a roaring river below. Uh, and if you blew up the railway, uh, especially when running into a tunnel, it would make uh, salvage almost impossible. Uh, the book also deals with the, um, uh, the problems of logistics of this kind of Arctic uh, special operations because um, um, obviously this, this had to be done by air uh, because um, I, uh, and and the only way to do this was to um, to uh, use uh, long range bombers that were to, uh, that were um, converted uh, for uh, uh, transport of paratroopers and uh, and um, uh, you know equipment. Uh, so they used this uh, B twenty four. Uh, which was the bomber with the longest range available. Uh, this was before the B-29 was available. Uh, and they were stripped from uh, f uh, f uh, a lot of the guns and they uh, removed the uh, oxygen supply, meaning that they would have to uh, stay in a relatively low altitude in order to uh, be able to reach Norway with any kind of... Uh, uh, significant payload. Uh, and the crews of this B-24s, they weren't ex exactly experienced in this type of flying because they had been flying uh, anti-submarine operations in the uh, over the Atlantic. Uh, and navigating in Arctic uh, condition is actually quite, you know, it's complicated because you would have uh, um, the problem of um, the, the magnetic north pole because you have to when you get that far north you have to uh, uh, calculate the um, this discrepancies between through north uh, or the magnetic north and the uh, geographical north and this is actually something that shifts uh, so uh, for instance between 1940 and 1945 uh, the degrees of shifts between the magnetic and the and the geographical north change by almost two degrees. Um, also, you would have um, so when they flew from uh, Norway, they would uh, enter Norwegian airspace at um, at uh, dusk or when the sun was uh, had just set. And they will uh, had to drop their payload and return and exit Norwegian airspace before the sunrise in order to um, not be exposed to fighters and anti-aircraft uh, guns. And um, uh, this, of course, is a problem when you have um, the midnight sun <laughs> or almost midnight sun, because even at uh, the the um, the um, latitude of Trondheim you get so far north it's it's hardly dark at um, uh, in summertime and all and the all, uh, alternative would would be flying at wind in winter time and that's also challenging because um, of the bad weather and these drops they were planned in um, in moon. Um, uh, as close to the full moon uh, as possible, and that gave just you know a couple of uh, just a four days uh, of window. And if there was a bad weather during the period where there was uh, um, optimal 
uh, moonlight, you know, you would have to wait for another month. Uh, and another uh, thing that would uh, complicate navigation uh, over to over Norway was that, um, especially in winter, because um, in uh, you would have, you know, navigation um, by radio uh, signals, and the further away from the signals you got, the more uh, the, um, the bigger the, the discrepancy. So they used a system called GEE, and uh, but when they uh, hit the Norwegian coast, it just flew on uh, uh, navigating uh, by uh, rivers, fjords, mountains. And you can imagine when the whole terrain is covered by snow, that this is, that is very difficult. Um, and having this inexperienced crews was you know a big problem because you know there were people like Ben Bolton uh, who were really uh, experienced in navigating uh, Ar the Arctic region you know uh, Ben Bolton he had been uh, complement um, he had accompanied the uh, uh, bird on his uh, expedition to the North Pole but he wasn't available uh, so this inexperienced crews and all the other difficulties was the main reasons for uh, um, two fatal accidents uh, and that uh, most of the, uh, the sorties flo flown in support of Operation Reaper was, um, was uh, you know, they were just... Uh, uh they um they were failures um and one of the more <laughs> interesting sideshows to this story is the uh is the mist drop into sweden uh which is uh, you know uh not not exactly part of the main narrative but you know it's uh, uh it shows uh at least from uh, the perspective of a historian, it shows how uh, even eyewitness accounts might, of the same events may differ widely. Uh, so you have um, accounts of this, uh, because what happened was that one of the aircraft uh, with the Leif Eista as the uh, senior uh, Norso officer on, on board, they flew um into Sweden and dropped uh some uh, 60 kilometers from the Norwegian border uh and the report of the pilots said uh, that uh, everybody knew that they were of course but uh, the, the uh, Norse operators gave their blessing to be dropped into unknown territory uh, Leif Oyster later claimed that they didn't, they, they were left to believe that they were on target. Uh, and I kind of believe that because, you know, the later events uh, kind of fits uh, that uh, version. And when they landed, they were apprehended by the Swedish authorities. But uh, there's a lot of... Um, discrepancies between the story told by the locals, the stories told by uh, the local sheriff and what the, the, the Norse uh, uh, people uh, remembered afterwards. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. It, oops. Uh, I had, oh, sorry, I have to, um, yeah. I have opened two uh, presentations at the same time. That was not, uh, yeah. So one of these crash happened at uh, the Plukjan mountain in, um, in Snosa. It's about, it's just a couple of kilometers north of, uh, of, uh, of Yavsha. Uh, if you can put up the map, I can point it out to you. If you have the Yafsha uh, map, or I can see if I can uh, pick it up myself. Um, well, 
we can only have one share screen going on at once. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Um. Yeah. Or at least it was um uh, uh quite a few uh, uh some kilometers north of uh, of Plukishan Mountain. And also, sorry, it's a couple of kilometers north of Yefsha Farm where they uh, established their base. So this th these pictures are from um, um, uh, on, the, on the upper left. It's from the uh, the ceremony held when they um, uh, when they um, uh, discovered the wreck site. So they gave a provisional burial to the crew and the operator and the. Um, and the um, uh, Norso man that died, and the upper right picture is from the a Norwegian newsreel from 1947 that uh, you can still see uh, the the wreck site is uh, pretty much intact. But if you go up to, into the mountain today, it's hardly anything left because it's you know people have been picking off uh, stuff. And uh, the lower pictures are from the same cer ceremony uh, uh, when the uh, memorial was uh, was um, disclosed. And you can see uh, Major Colby to the left uh, in this picture and his uh, Norwegian uh, favorite, so to say, Herbert Telgesen to the right. Yeah, th this map is kind of, you know, it's, rather um it's more um easy to understand than the uh the um you know the topographical maps so this is from a publication on woodlark and the deep uh, uh, published in 1995 so you can see the uh, uh outline of the operations um uh, going from yafsha uh okay sorry uh this pad is really sensitive uh so um so the first operation they were attacked they went on was um to attack a railway bridge along the Nord nordland Ra nordland railroad which runs along the the the, the snosa lake and exits north uh Originally, they had planned to attack a much larger bridge called Granabirt, which was a uh, uh, bridge, a uh, tall bridge on uh, on um, pillars, uh, which would have been, you know, a much more um, um, opportune target because it would have um, taken the Germans a lot more effort to repair the damage. But as it turns out, the they had too few men. Uh, this was a recurring problem. Uh, they had too few men to uh, defeat the guard detail on the bridge. Uh, and in addition to on um, to uh, place the explosive explosives on such a large target would have taken too long. So they opted for a the attack on this uh, bridge at Pangan, and the attack occurred on. Uh, April the 15th, uh, and then they um, uh, retreated, um, taking a more uh, southern uh, route into uh, Sweden. And in this area, uh, just before they cross the Swedish border, they run into, or they almost run into a German patrol. Uh, because um, the, the Germans sent a patrol from the south uh, uh, in order to intercept them. Uh, but luckily, they uh, managed to discover the Germans before they discovered them, and they um, set out uh, to cross the mountain in um, in this area. So they, uh, and in this um and along the border, the border mountains are really steep. Uh, they could you could barely ski up uh, the hills. Um, and um, according to the uh, uh, to the stories, they uh, had to break out this uh, benzogen pills uh, uh, in order to uh, muster enough strength to uh, to uh, 
to negotiate the, the terrain. So they crossed into Sweden and they came to um, the, no the base of the Norwegian group called the Woodlark in this area. They but had they actually had the base uh, on the Swedish side, uh, which of course wasn't, <laughs> you know, technically it was not. Uh, it was a, it was a violation of Swedish neutrality, uh, but the Swedes were very well aware of their presence. So, and I deal with some de interesting details on this in my book. So, um, and there they rested, uh, ate um, uh, some moose uh, meat, uh, but the woodlark uh, group they were on the British command. They were reprimanded afterwards because you know they were so difficult to keep uh, supplied so they didn't uh, appreciate americans coming in and eating all their stores uh, um, subtext here is of course that the, 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 the british didn't like americans coming in and meddling in their business uh yeah sure is of course here and the last uh, mission uh, that they went on, they attacked on the Luridal, um, um the railway in Luridal, uh, which happened on the 24th of April. Uh, they took uh, the approach march, went along this route, and they split into groups of three. And um, I'll show you the, um, the uh, map detailing the attack. Um, so, uh, this is the one, uh, and if I s can zoom in, uh, so they came down this, uh, gorge, uh, from their forward operational base, came down this gorge and split into groups that would attack the railway at different points. Uh, so the idea was to, um, you know, create as much damage as possible. Uh, so they, um, uh, and the, the way they did this was to um, use as small charges as possible. And uh, they would uh, blow up um, every other um, joint between the, uh, the, the, the rails. So the northernmost group consisted of Lieutenant Sate uh, and two others. Uh, so that they and they were in a very precarious sit, uh, position because they had this very steep hill at their back. So if they were uh, discovered by the Germans, they would have to uh, either uh, kind of fight their way uh, around the mountain or try to go straight up. The same for another group. Uh, Major Colby was in this group, uh, the third from the north. Um, uh, they ha attacked a um, uh, closest to the tunnel, which was heavily guarded. And the, the some more southern groups had a much. Uh, uh, they had more easier uh, targets, or at least targets with uh, less uh, chance of being uh, being uh, uh, discovered by the Germans. So, so the red squares here uh, and the text indicates uh, the location of German guard post or, um, or barracks. In total along this stretch of railroad, the Germans had about a little about 100, 100 men. Um, and there were some, not exactly firefights, but when they started to set off the charges, the Germans reacted, but they probably had no clue about where uh, the, the attackers came from and then just fired uh, wildly around them. And Major Colby said that, don't return fire because it, you only reveal our position. Mm -hmm. And they managed to, um, to, um, uh, get away uh, in one piece, no no casualties, 
and they um, uh, returned on this more easterly uh, route. And it's I think it's quite interesting that um, they didn't have any casualties except for a few scratches in the actual attacks, but <laughs> The, the fatal um the fatalities they suffered was actually from the deployment uh when trying to drop reinforcements um and you know it, it tells you kind of you know the um what the difficulties of these operations were uh you know uh, you may assume in a regular a military operation getting from a to b is um you know, the least of your problems while engaging the enemy is your major challenge. But, you know, in these Arctic operations, it was completely um, uh, the opposite. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, just sort of put a yeah. background. The, the purpose of the operation, now this was in April, March, yeah. April, May. This is when the the war in europe was ending yeah and everyone as i understand it you can correct me if i'm wrong pretty much everyone understood germany was losing yeah e even though the german propaganda wouldn't admit it um you 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 sort of could see the map in 1941 and the map in 1945 it's pretty clear that they were losing yeah uh, the purpose of the operation the main purpose was to keep Germany from moving troops from Norway to the rest of Europe to uh, engage the Allies. They wanted to keep the German troops in Germany. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And But you have to remember that this operation was planned back in January, mm -hmm. uh, just after the Battle of the Bulge. And it kind of shows the inertia or the, you know, when you have prepared an operation, it kind of get its own momentum it and very uh, and there's no reassessment of the purpose of the operation so it just kind of uh keeps it just you know uh it it, it keeps on uh it's uh, you know on its track um so you know to be fair sometime in at least before 24th of march somebody should have said hey wait a minute this is you know this is redundant by this time uh you know but nobody did and i uh, um and nobody of the uh, i think they just didn't dare to say to people that were you know uh geared up to take to do their part uh to say that sorry uh <laughs> the war is over <laughs> uh, and you, you and you find testimonies, especially all this from this um, the man that was dropped into Sweden. Their main concern was that the war was going to be over before they got into the fight. You know, so uh, yeah, so you know, you kind of get this uh, narrow perspective when you're in this kind of operations that it's very difficult, at least for civilians, to grasp in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, and the peacetime uh, part of the operation is also, I think, very interesting. Uh, these are some pictures from um, and from various uh, phases of the, you know, peacetime um, operations, if I can, if I may say so. So uh, the the upper left picture is from. Uh, we think it's from Stainchai, uh, uh, because when the the war was over um, in Norway, that was eighth uh, of May, um, they weren't allowed to um, to move out of the mountain because uh, I, I discussed this a little bit in my book because some um, uh, you know the official version uh, is that they weren't. Uh, they weren't allowed down because they, uh, their 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 superior superiors were afraid that they would would cause uh, they would complicate the German surrender. 
On the other hand, some may also suspect that they didn't want the Americans to take the glory of the uh, yeah. you know, the peace celebrations. Uh, and that was exactly what happened because when they finally were allowed down from the mountains on the 11th of May, you know, they they, they uh, got cheered on throughout uh, the local communities. Uh, so they came to Snosa, uh, they came they traveled to Steinskjær, Levanger and Sjördar and all these communities and they were hailed like they had won the war themselves single-handedly. Um, and they were, you know, they were they were just you know um, um, 30 40 men uh, and and this is um, um, uh, the, the upper right picture is from Varnes and quite interesting this this building still stands it's uh, near the uh, officers mess on the uh, south side of the runway and you can see uh, in this picture, you can see those, these guys with officer, no, with the uh, garrison caps. Those are Americans. But if you see, uh, look closer, you can see these guys with berets. They are uh, Norwegians, uh, originally under British command, but they, you know, they kind of, uh, hey, the Americans are paying a lot better. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, you know, they, they were. Uh, quite interesting dynamics because you know the, the operation Woodlark, which they came from, kind of wound down. And uh, in order to get their piece of ac the action, they joined up with the Americans, and he, and they got quite close, you know, because you know these Americans, they were you know most of them were born in Norway and they spoke Norwegian fluently, so they they bonded uh, quite well, and. Um, on the, the um, uh, lower uh, pictures are from uh, Varnes Airfield. You can see this is uh, Lieutenant Hall. Uh, he was the leader of the follow-up force called uh, Norso 2, uh, standing beside the German Kubelwagen uh, war booty. And uh, this is in, in behind him is hangar number five. And this is where the home guard have their indoor fire range. So I fired a lot of shots in that, uh, in that hangar. Uh, in, the in the lower middle picture, there are the, the, uh, the Americans are preparing for the visit of um, uh, Crown Prince, uh, Crown Prince uh, Olaf on May, June the 10th. Yes, yeah, so and this is a group picture of the uh, both um, both groups uh, are both the Norso One group that um, that conducted the sabotage mission and the Norso Two, the follow up or follow up force. And this picture you can also find in the uh, in the uh, uh, book that was issued in 1975. I guess a lot of uh, uh, family of uh, this uh, and fans of this uh, uh, Ripper group has this publication at home. Yes. Yeah, and you wanted to discuss the um, the um, uh, issue of this uh, German patrol uh, running into the base on May the 2nd. Um, and of course, that's a... Uh, um, a very complicated uh, topic, and um, so the basic uh, outline of the story that everybody can agree upon is that uh, on May the second, uh, everybody knew that the war was winding down. They, you know, they had the radio, so they could listen in on radio broadcasts. Um, although not much detail was divulged on the situation in Norway, they had a quite good uh, inkling uh, or overview over what the situation in Europe was. So the story goes that they were listening on the radio and the um, and the guy standing guard uh, out outside in the of, in the yard. Uh, he was probably more preoccupied with what was on the radio than actually 
um, um, uh, actually doing his guard duty. So uh, I know it was still winter and a, um, a German patrol um, um, stumbled into on skis, stumbled into the yard. And there was a um, standoff uh, developing. Um, so, um, and that's kind of where the agreement uh, ends. So, uh, the first version is that uh, this American um, engaged the uh, Germans in a uh, uh, parlay, so to say. Um, that uh, trying to convince the Germans to lay down their weapons, that the war was soon over, and there were, you know, uh, 30, 40 men armed to their teeth, teeth inside the building. Um, and the Germans were seemingly giving up uh, their weapons, but um, uh, then the Norwegian. Uh, one of the Norwegian resistance fighters joining Reaper was stumbled outside, and Kai, and in the ensuing confusion, the Germans fired a shot uh, that hit um, the Norwegian in the hip, and mm. it all developed into a firefight in which all the Germans were killed. Uh, in another version of the story, the Norwegian, um, the Norwegian. Um, resistant fighter is engaging these Germans in this um, conversation. And as the uh, the Germans are about to lay down their arm, arms, the, uh, uh, the, the submachine gun of the, uh, the sergeant leading the patrol uh, misfires because this was uh, something this, uh, this uh, MP40 submachine guns were quite prone to do. And in the confusion following, they um, there was and you know and then followed the firefight. Uh, the third main version, so to say, is the more more controversial one, in which the Germans lay down their weapons, and then get gets executed. And this is uh, uh, a version that kind of have have been developing over the post-war years. Uh, the, the main problem with that version is, of course, that uh, there's no doubt that the guy got shot. And the Norwegian guy got shot first. And to think that these highly trained American uh, paratroopers were going to give the Germans a chance to surrender after having opened fire I think it's highly unlikely that they, you know, because people react on instinct in those situations. And it's a life and death situation where you have to make split second decisions and it's either me or you. Uh, so I think that's the first uh, major uh, problem with that version. Uh, the second version is it that it is developing over the years. Uh, and it's one of the um, origins of that story is a novel, in fact, uh, where, okay, the novel is quite frank, saying that this is a rumor. But, you know, uh, historical novels, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, has this problem that uh, readers aren't always um, able to distinguish fact from fiction over the years. Uh, and another thing that happens is that this story gets influenced by uh, by events, com contemporary events. For instance, when you get up to um, the 2000s, when these stories about uh, um, um, uh, Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib breaks, the story changes. So you get a version saying that uh, the Germans, in, oh, well, sorry, the Americans encouraged the Norwegians to, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
pee on the corpses and that they buried them in the uh, uh, under the you know where the waste from the uh, the uh, you know the cattle uh, you know the I don't know the English word for it, but you know, under the the barn where the cows where there was, you know, there's a deposit for manure, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, and it's you know, then this side, this uh, version of the story gets published in one of the Norwegian uh, major Norwegian newspapers, you know. So, uh, and by that time, you know, it it has uh, the story has expand expanded beyond. Uh, what's uh, I mean expanded beyond speculation, and you can also uh, see that they are they are based on the testimony of this guy that was shot, and what happened with him was that he was uh, uh, dragged into the uh, the uh, into the uh, uh, the house. And he was, you know, he was in shock and he didn't have much, uh, you know, grasp of what was going on around him. But, you know, uh, he has been or had been um, uh, questioned by journalists, you know, and when people are getting um, questions that are, you know, uh, leading uh People's memory gets memories get changed, and we have seen this uh, time and time again with uh, eyewitnesses of traumatic events. If they aren't interviewed by professionals, uh, you risk contaminating their memories, and I I guess that's what happened in in this case. Um, so uh, that at least is my take on the on the story, and you know, people may have different opinions uh, about this, but I think the main uh, line here is is that it there are too many different versions of this story to uh, draw any uh, conclusions. Really, um, how how many how many yeah. people were actually killed in that uh, fight? I mean, was it uh, five Germans. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I have after I published the book, I found a note in the archives of the uh, Norwegian Home Front that suggests that one of the Germans uh, survived the, the firefight, but he was so badly wounded that they, you know, they gave him uh, mercy and you know. Uh, Put him out of his misery because there's no way he was going to survive an extraction to Sweden or whatever they were going to do. Um, and also, there's you know there's all kinds of circumstantial, uh, uh, not evidence, but you know, uh, for instance, uh, Colby is said to have um, instructed uh, witnesses to keep quiet. And this was, you know, standard procedure for these groups. They weren't allowed to talk about their operations uh, or any aspects of it. So it, you know, uh, not meaning specifically this uh, this um, uh, this incident with this German patrol. Uh, and also, there's a kind of a um, <clears throat> statement by Borge Langelan that can also be interpreted in this way, uh, saying something like. You don't take prisoners in a guerrilla campaign, and it's very vague, and it could just as easily be interpreted as you know, uh, as a post facto, uh, uh, you know, trying to rationalize what had happened, trying to see, so to say, see the bright side of it, and you know, uh, yeah, and that's yeah, mm -hmm. that's the story, so to say. I um, well, yeah, and uh, I would uh, like to bring up another topic. Uh, so I, mean, I think that covered it very well, and it's a good section the book covers. Um, I uh, have um, uh, the distinction of having worked for both the British government and the American government, 
Um, my wife was uh, stationed in England, and I worked with the National Health Service, and I've also worked with the uh, IRS in America. And uh, uh, I have to say, very, very interesting parts about the rivalry between the two government, particularly, I guess, uh, the initially, they, uh, particularly between Rosa and Ch Churchill, you had a strong bond and early in the war, but I take it as the war progressed, people were starting to thinking about the what's going to happen after Europe. And England had a interest in maintaining its influence in Europe. Do you want to yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and it's kind of, you know, uh, confusing in a way because uh, there's, the country or the government, so to say, they aren't uniform actors. You know, they aren't uniform players in this, because, uh, and as I state in the book, the inter-service rivalry between the uh, British Secret Service and the SOE is just as uh, just as strong as the as the um, rivalry between the SOE and the OSS, and it also uh, um, fluctuates through time and especially towards the end of the war the cooperation between uh, the Scandinavian section of the SOE and the OSS is quite good and uh, and um, so my uh, take on it is that the resistance of or the, the, the resistance among British agencies against uh, American involvement in Scandinavia manifests itself uh, first and foremost in logis logistics and communications. Uh, so th these were uh, uh, the th those parts of the special operations that were most, most integrated. For instance, you had uh, 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 squadrons uh, supplying both American and British uh, units. You would have a uh, um, 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 radio operators. They were, you know, um, at the headquarters in London. They would serve both British and uh, American units. And you see time and again that you know the the Americans. Um, in Snosa, they just get ignored. Uh, I think there's no doubt about it, or at least they get in ignored until they kind of uh, hint that they are about to do something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then, they, then the people react. Uh, and especially early on in the war, uh, you get the feeling that the British are regarding the Americans as amateurs, provincials. Uh, and in some ways they they were, but you know, um, especially within the field of intelligence, I mean, fresh look at uh, intelligence was highly, uh, uh, I think it was uh, very much needed because uh, classical British intelligence is, you know, um, or at least, you know, uh, how the, the, the MI6 were uh, going about it in, during the war was sending uh, agents into enemy occupied territory, observing and uh, relaying the messages back by radio. But then the OSS uh, uh, turned up and said, hey, why would we do that when you can get the same kind of information from the library, you know? <laughs> So, so yeah, it's you know the Americans were um, kind of a, you know uh, thinking outside the, the traditional box of intelligence, pointing out that uh, open source uh, intelligence, as it's called, it's just as uh, profitable as you know the the highly dangerous uh, business of you know this kind of James Bond like operations. Uh, which may 
you know, uh, result in the loss of lives. It costs a lot of uh, resources, and you know, it's also, um, um you know, it, it kind of gives you away what your intentions are because you know, uh, if you are detected, uh, you get an operate uh, <laughs> an agent that can be interrogated. You know. So uh, yeah, uh, the Americans were uh, much more uh, innovative uh, because they they were because they weren't professional intelligence operators. You know, many of them came from business. Uh, they were lawyers, and they were uh, used to handle uh, large amounts of information, um, collating and correlating uh, information and. Um, for instance, uh, you know, there's a British author called Max Hastings. You know, he's uh, very frequently, I think he's one of the most interviewed historians on all kinds of uh, uh, World War II related uh, documentaries. And he, in his book, uh, uh, I don't remember the title now, but, you know, he, he kind of goes through the uh, various uh, aspects of wartime intelligence. And his uh, major take is that uh, uh, the Americans or the OSS were, you know, uh, yeah, they were amateurs, but their way, their way of gathering uh, intelligence uh, from open sources were unsurpassed. Uh, and I think this is um, um, also reflects on, uh, for instance, how this. Um, operational groups were put together. So they, uh, and how they, the, the whole idea of using natives, uh, which, you know, because the British, they would, uh, at least outside Scandinavia, they would run into all kinds of problems because uh, they were kind of biased against, you know, people they regarded as provincial or primitive or whatever. But uh, and also um, uh, a lot of nationalities held grudges against the British because you know legacies of uh, colonization and great power rivalry and so on and so on. And but the Americans, you know, they were uh, new to this game. And um, in the this was before. Uh, so America was straight out of isol uh, isolation uh, in foreign policy. So uh, people in general was very positive to uh, having Americans around, much more so than uh, having the British around. Yeah. Um, not, to forget, not to forget, they actually uh, treated Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> uh, the, the doctors from the OSS saved the... Uh, Ho Chi Minh from a, uh, I think it was from an infection during the Japanese occupation of Vietnam. <laughs> uh, wait, uh, Michael has a question. Michael, do you want to yeah. or comment? Yeah, thanks a lot. Listen, this is a really, really important book. And I want to thank, yeah. um, thank the author for putting this together. Uh, the Norso story has been hidden for a long time. And I just really welcome uh, the this book in, in, in general, and then specifically to reveal um, the major issues that in, were involved in this particular operation. I, I really think that this is just terrific. Uh, a, a couple of comments. Uh, the, the, I have a personal interest in this. Um, uh, growing up, I grew up with uh, writer John Grunseth, who was uh, one of the first group uh, that uh, uh, parachuted into France. Uh, as you know, um, uh, William Colby discovered there was a whole group of Norwegian Americans, uh, predominantly Norwegian Americans, being trained in winter warfare in Colorado and went out and recruited about 80 of them. And so they were uh, special forces ready. And um, in particular, on the operational side, uh, the Norwegian groups, uh, in particular, performed exceptionally well in the special warfare operations. The, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the command and control uh, was not that well versed in war special warfare, 
And as a result, some of these operations didn't work out very successfully. And the RIPE is a perfect example of um, decisions made uh, maybe out of omission or maybe out of commission uh, that resulted in a, a really a, a failed operation. Uh, and lastly, um, I, I will tell you that uh, William Colby uh, it, it didn't always, uh, wasn't held in particular high regard with several uh, of the members of the uh, Norso group in particular after this operation. And I don't want to get into that controversy, but the, I really want to thank you for, for putting this together. And um, there is a small book uh, about Norso, which describes all of the operations uh, from the first drop uh, that uh, uh, writer John Grunseth uh, made. Uh, he was a first lieutenant. Uh, his, uh, uh, co the captain that was in charge of the operation was killed uh, 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 shortly after um, the drop and he took over the command of the, of the operation. Uh, and it goes all the way through Ripa and at, through the end. And then they also ended up in China. So yeah. uh, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, I hope we can hear more about uh, Norso in the future. Okay, good. Thank you. And Janet, you have your hand raised. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for staying up late for us too. So we appreciate it. Uh, there are two things. One was this in, this British uh, American mm -hmm. rivalry when I'm talking to Sphere uh, Knutson uh, at the um, uh, Knut uh, Sphereson at the Justice Museum in Trondheim. After the war, when they had the legal purge, a lot of the Americans wanted to grab some of the people that the Norwegians were bringing to trial. Some of them were Germans, and I thought that was interesting. They were trying to get yeah. intel and bringing them over. Yeah. And then the other thing was about your map. I see a mm. lot of lakes there, so going, they had to be frozen pretty solid even in March, right, to go over all that. Yeah. That was actually uh, one of the problems because uh, what happens is that you get uh, periods of thaw and you get, and then it freezes over so you can have a lake that looks like it's, it's frozen solid, but it's just thin crust of ice on top of water before you have more ice. So you have layers upon layers with ice and snow, ice and now you have ice and water, ice and water. Uh, we call it Overwan in Norwegian. Uh, so you, although you you may not drown, you can go through it and get soaking wet, mm -hmm. and this happens to the river also. Uh, so um, and then you also have the problem of uh, uh, rivers because you know rivers doesn't freeze as easily because of the current, and then you have the problems of snow bridges. That is, you may have. A what looks like a plain, but there's um, there's a, a river or a creek that has dug away uh, snow, so it the, the river just runs below the snow, and it might may just be a thin layer of snow, and it looks just like a level field, mm -hmm. and if you ski through that, you know you just. Uh, fall through and get soaking wet. And th this is one of the major uh, advantages uh, of uh, my engaging local guides. Uh, you know, several of these people, Hans Leirmo and Albert Helgesen and all this, they knew this area as the, the, uh, as the back of their hand. So they knew all this, uh, you know, uh, where the, these rivers were dangerous to cross. Uh, and you how to, uh, for instance, um, when you cross a lake, you want to stay away from uh, uh, river estuaries, <laughs> and they are not always easy to know, uh, but uh, or even by looking at a map. And those maps you see there, they are really bad. <laughs> there's a, for instance, there's a, I refer to this in my book, one of the bridges on this map, it's actually located 750 meters uh, wrong. <laughs> so, and then this is something also that's um, um, stated in the report that this the, this bridge we're going to blow up, it's just not there. <laughs> Location. And if, if, if they hadn't had these uh, local guides, they wouldn't have known before they were there. Or at least before they went out on rec uh, reconnaissance. 
So, uh, Jorgen, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I uh, listened to your uh, talk about, uh, you know, the situation towards the end of the war, and that's very interesting, including, of course, the rivalry between the U.S. and, and Great Britain. Uh, remembering from my dad, now he passed 40 years ago, so I may not have all the dates, etc. right, but he was much further west. But the two, two things he mentioned that they were talking about, because everybody knew Germany were, were beaten, as you said, but one was, of course, that uh, the Soviet Union was sitting with most of Finn, Mark, and moving down there. And the other thing, which they were also aware of, and of course, the government was probably very, very aware of that, whereas my dad, as I said, he was only a sergeant at the time, um, was some of these resistance groups were communist uh, run, especially mostly in, in the Oslo area and further east, I think. But that was also something they had been he was aware of, I don't know to the extent, and for, I wish I could have asked him, but way too late now, but uh, yeah. but that was something they were also, did, did you hear about that? Uh, since these guys were obviously much closer to the to the Russian uh, army. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, funny enough, it's not mentioned at all. You know, there's a lot of fear about the region Quislings uh, making a last stand uh, after the Germans surrendered. There's no mention of of uh, communists uh, and I think there's probably um, several reasons or at least uh, two reasons um, and a couple of years ago there was a PhD uh, written about the relations between the state sponsored uh, middle org resistance and the communists that they concluded that they actually had quite a good working relationship. So they were, you know, they weren't those conflicts that you see in, that you saw in other occupied countries. And another thing is that um, as far as politics goes, uh, the OSS actually had the culture of uh, uh, not being anti-communist because you actually get a lot of uh, left-winged um, field operators in the OSS. For instance, uh, uh, in, on the, in the Balkans, they actually favor um, uh, the partisans, the com communist partisans, and Tito over the um, the more right-winged uh, uh, resistance under uh, Dragovic and. You know, uh, so I don't think it was really an issue, but, uh, and this also relates to what um, uh, what Janet was asking about this, uh, you know, it's called Operation Claw, uh, where the germ, um, the Swedes and the OSS actually cooperated with uh, each other to interrogate uh, German uh, intelligence officers, uh, and this was under the nose of uh, under the um, um, outside the knowledge of both Norwegians and uh, the, the British. So they went into prison camps in the Lillehammer area to interrogate uh, German intelligence officers with the knowledge of um, the the Soviets, and they uh, and also. Um, uh, you know, they had this Operation Paperclip where they would seek out uh, technology, uh, mm -hmm. military technology that may be uh, useful for the Allies. But there's no mentioning in the sources that Gripa was a part of it, a part of this. Um, either because, you know, there wasn't, they, they weren't trained for it, uh, apart from Roger Hall. Uh, commander of the uh, of the um, uh, the uh, North Two, uh, they didn't re they was they weren't really trained as intelligence operators. They were special operations operators. So uh, if there were any um, people uh, from OSS taking part in this in the Trendelag area, it, it's not very likely that uh, Colby and also was part of it. 
or at least there's no evidence of it. Yes. One, one thing um, I noticed is um, looking at the pictures is how young uh, Kobe looked in those pictures. And he was in his 20s during the operation. Um, you want to talk a little bit about his uh, leadership style and the effect of his leadership? Um, yeah, it's a bit hard to grasp, really. But, you know, it seems like a very low-key leader. And it, that's kind of what you would expect in a special operations team. Uh, you know, because... Uh, Leadership in a special operations group, it's, mu it's much more um, uh, level, it's, you know, because you have highly trained specialists and not regular infantry. So, you know, uh, people are more, there are more mutual respect between uh, uh, commander and uh, the men, or that's the usual uh, uh, mode of operation, so to say. So, uh, and Colby comes across as a type that's not going to um, um, uh, you know, uh, he, he's, you know, he's more inclusive in his decision making or at, uh, or at least that's the, that's the impression that you get from the Norwegians that operated alongside him. I don't know if the uh, the Americans may have had a uh, another take on it, as Jürgen mentioned that he may not have been uh, very popular, but uh, after the war, but uh, at least the Norwegians that came in contact with him held him in a very high regard. Mm -hmm. um, you made some comments on uh, historical fiction. And yeah. I know um, um, Janet is mainly a, writes historical fiction, and Floyd, you, uh, Jorgen, you also have written historical fiction. Yeah. Did you want to make a comment in favor of historical fiction? J Janet, uh, you want to make a defense of historical fiction? Trying to unmute. Yeah. I well, I I feel like I have a heavy responsibility to get things right, yeah. and uh, I have things happening in the background, like this latest one. I was really helped by the Gestapo Museum in Bergen to get things right, uh, and it takes a long time, and you know can't interfere with the storyline. But um, I just feel a heavy responsibility, and it goes back to my first interviews with people who lived in my community who were young people in the war. And when they tell me their stories, I I feel like I have to be true to them. You know, I can make mistakes, <laughs> but I do try to make sure it doesn't go too wild on the on the fiction yeah, because, side. Yeah, and I mean, it's in between the facts, there are uh, a lot of space for the imagination, you know, for the fiction. But I feel that sometimes, and especially with the subtle things, uh, for instance, uh, social relations, uh, gender issues, uh, it's, you know, when you write, for instance, just writing a dialogue, you imply a lot of relations, for instance, between, uh, between, um, a man and his wife between children and parents, the way they talk to each other, that may or may not be out of place, you know. Uh, so, you know, I'm not too skeptical, but mostly to uh, historical fiction set in much older uh, periods, because then you have to make a lot of assumption about how people... Yeah related to each other that you don't exactly have a uh, basis for. And one of the most, I don't know if you're familiar familiar with Sigrid Unset. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, she, her uh, novels on Christian Lovenanstadte is set in the Middle Ages, but it's actually a comment on uh, 
uh, women's uh, rights uh, in contemporary society. You know, so, so she actually used it, uh, used the historical context to write about issues that she couldn't uh, write about in, you know, in, uh, you know, clear language. So, you know, um, and I think that was, you know, today it's very well recognized, but back then it was, you know, it was a necessity in order to speak about things that you right. couldn't uh, speak about right out. I, I, I agree. I mean, my, my historical fiction goes also way back in time. And um, I enjoy, really enjoy uh, reading historical fiction. Not so much about World War II, because I, I find it's, it's very easy that when you write historical fiction, of course, you have to make assumption and guesswork and all that stuff. But that's very hard when you come to recent times, because it's, uh, well, I hate to, to uh, read a historical fiction where there's something really wrong. You know, it's, let's say that you had his, Germany won the Battle of Britain. Then it kind of, sort of whole, it ruins the whole thing for me because we all know that didn't happen. Yeah. So, uh, so yes. um, but I mean, I, I'm yeah. not on the level of <laughs> it's a <Sigrid> I'm <laughs> like two inches tall compared to her. But, uh, but um, yeah. I think her her books have, have been very enjoyable. And also uh, for those who read English, uh, the Hornblower Saga. If you read, yeah. it. I really that to me is is a brilliant way of writing historical fiction because he writes about three events well a, a true war I should say but all the big battles you always notice that uh, Hornblower is not in it <laughs> he's always yeah. on the other option so you he can keep the sort of historical time, yeah. timeline and yet we still get a very exciting uh, story out of it so that's yeah, would... kind of like the ideal historical fiction because you can make yourself believe it even though you know it is fiction yeah i i like the hornblower series although i'd hate to yeah. see someone try to write a novel about the battle of trafalgar with all those ships involved that would be quite a challenge but um uh like my, one of my favorite books is catch 22 which is a historical novel but it's uh more of a comedy than history. So you have, you know, a lot of uh, yeah, yeah. options within it, but, uh, you know, it was one of, it uh, emphasizes one of the factors of World War II that people were fighting, but they're always had a side hustle on the side, you know, yeah. always, you know, trying to find a way of getting out of rations and things like that. So it, it had a sort of a balance to some of the more patriotic histories yeah yeah my yeah, favorite I, one is i love the sharp series by bernard cornwell and i never thought i'd get interested in the peninsula war because as an american i didn't know much about it you know we're dealing with the battle of 1812 in america but there's stuff happening in that time period i i just really enjoyed that series and I, i've met him in person twice and he's he does a lot of deep research he's walked over those battlefields and can describe stuff that doesn't sound like he's throwing every fact at you. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about writing, if you do write a novel about Germany winning the Battle of Britain, you have you are you have your back completely free. You can write <laughs> just about anything. <laughs> you know, you, you know, yeah, you can kind of if you if you try to make everything right, the the the, the you know the uh, the fall if you get something wrong is that much higher than if you just write com like construct a, uh, an alternate universe from the start yeah <laughs> which is popular these days yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially in movies yeah but uh, like know, um just to mention an example, I mean, like the first, uh, the opening section of Janet's latest book, the, um, uh, what, what's your, the... Brizzling Code. Brizzling Code. Uh, I really feel like you're that person in the rooms uh, typing out the uh, code. You know, you really, um, you can have a, 
an encounter with the events that you really don't have in a well-written uh, straight history. Yeah, if you do it right, you know, there's some really, I read something recently and there was something wrong about the, you know, the wireless transmitter. So I immediately emailed my friend in UK, Bob Pearson, who's coming in. He's, he has access to all the British, all that records that's been released in the last, you know, 20 years. Now you can look at Shetland bus, you know, everything. You can see everything now. But I said, Something is really wrong, and it really threw me off because I didn't. You know, they're talking about um, Lunavo, and it just did not ring right that they could do what the characters are doing. So that kind of threw me off. But yeah. most stuff I've read, I, I enjoy historical fiction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it it is, um, yeah. World War Two is just fascinating. Uh, and so how it was really the, a world war. Everyone, even countries in Latin America were involved. I mean, this was affected everybody and it changed their lives uh, radically. And, uh, uh, you know, and how everyone felt involved in the war. Um, you know, uh, my father was uh, an isolationist before um, Pearl Harbor and Pearl Harbor came and the next day he signed up to be an aviator in the Navy. You know, it just, how, you know, yeah, it's affected everybody's really lives. Yeah. Norway was also quite isolationist before the war. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was kind of, you know, all the all over the political spectrum from the labor movement to the conservatives, they were all, you know, we we're going to stay out of it because it has been, Norway was quite successful during the First World War to stay out of the war, you know, uh, technology kind of caught up with you. So, and to, even more today, nowhere on the planet is safe if war breaks out somewhere and if there's a major power in all it's bound to have consequences for everybody. But, uh, I mean, war, World War, well, both wars were terrible. I mean, but the casualty rate of World War One. Um, I mean, that was something you would just rather avoid. It was, uh, uh, I mean, of course, World War II. And I think every family, including mine, has said people died in World War II. It's, it's uh, you know, how, and the casualty rate in, in Russia is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, my dad did secret work for um, Brit for American Naval Ordnance, and he was a working on his PhD in magnetics. So he was sent to try to figure out how to debug the German mines they were laying off Long Island, and I think the Gulf of Mexico. But um, yeah, hey. there, I was gonna say there's a, there's a show that's called World War II TV with a two. And they have historians all the time. I'd love to see you on there, Frodo. Um, yeah. they have all <laughs> kinds of stuff. Um, they're doing everything from the Pacific. They've had stuff on like, uh, you know, members of the, I forget what the group was, but mostly from India who were at the Dunker. You never hear these stories. So um, you can go find it. It's on YouTube and they're running all kinds of stuff, you know, like uh, because the, um, that new show on, uh, I think, A plus or Apple plus, you know, about the, the fl Americans flying over, you know, bombing and all that. Uh, there's been a lot of stuff on yeah. that. It's a really good show. Yeah, um, Masters of the Air, is it called something? I'm sorry, what? Masters of the Air. And Masters Most, of the yeah. Air, yeah. So it's World, yeah. World, it's World War II TV, and it's yeah. out of, he's stationed in Normandy. He's Brit. He's a Brit, but it's yeah. really good. He's been a um, Normandy beach guide for like 20 years, but he has the most interesting historians on, and you can catch up with any any of them, but some yeah. of the some there, there, there's actually yeah there's actually a scene for in that series showing the the the, um, the American bombing raid on the U-boat pens in Trondheim on uh, yeah. on July the twenty fourth, nineteen forty three, three, and uh, of course. <laughs> um, uh, I struggle a bit with that scene because, you know, uh, 
uh, and this is where you get really uh, nerdy about these things because yeah. it shows <laughs> they came they come in from the northwest, oh. and then you have a scene where they are bombing, uh, and you see the plane flying from uh, northeast towards southwest. And that may be so if they turned around and made their bombing runs, but uh, but we do know where the bomb fell, bombs fell, you know, and and they fell from the harbor and in the northeasterly direction, and that doesn't uh, comply with the scenes in the series at all. <laughs> so, uh, and I thought I was able to get a hold on an actual combat combat footy, footage from that attack because in, in the American National Archives there's mm. a short film uh, um, uh, about four minutes long and I finally managed to get a hold on, on a di digital copy of it wow. um, uh, but sadly because it says it's about uh, the attack on Trondheim in their catalogue but when I found finally got to see it, it was from the attack the same day on Harøya, and that's in southern Norway. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is actually been miscatalogued by the, the by the by the uh, national archives. So I was quite uh, disappointed when I because I thought I finally got a hold on the uh, on the. Um, on the, you know the real deal, but you know, in sadly no. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, uh, anyone have um, any questions? Uh, just one yeah. quick question. Oh, sorry. Did you? I was just going to ask uh, for the where is the best part to uh, way to order your book from Amazon or for directly from Norway? Or? Yeah, I uh, don't. Uh, you, you know the uh, what book? The, the most recent one, yeah. Uh, yeah, Amazon, because, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's published on Casemate, and it's uh, it's actually difficult to get a hold on in Norway. Uh, oh. You can order it online, uh, but I don't, I don't know for certain if any bookstores actually have it. So, <laughs> a bit, bit odd, but, you know. Right. Yeah. But Amazon is good. Yeah. Yeah. And... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of uh, Kindle uh, electronic books, and then just order on that and you get it immediately. So I, I like that. Does, uh, your, does yeah. your publisher have uh, connections in the U.S. for distribution? Yeah, it's actually it's a, a British American company. Because so yeah, are, uh, uh, yeah we have. Uh, a, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The main office is in Washington D.C. Oh, perfect. Because yeah. we have Seattle has built a quite amazing uh, Nordic museum. It has all Scandinavian countries in it. But um, I, I'm going to go down there in a couple of weeks. And that's a book that should be in the bookstore, I think. Yeah. So I'll pursue that. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, Jeannie, you had a question. Yes, I did. Um, for Froda. Um, in this operation, now I have not read the book. Did all the OSS uh, men survive through the operation? And then my uh, second, second question was, um, were there any reprisals of Norwegians uh, after this, all this sabotage and all that? Yeah. To the first question, uh, everybody that landed uh, that was actually dropped survived. There were a few people uh, uh, getting various injuries, but everybody that managed to jump survived. The casualties mm -hmm. were those who died in the plane crashes. Mm -hmm. So there were, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about eight people who were killed in plane crashes mm -hmm. on uh, March the uh, 31st and uh, April uh, 6th. And then, so but yeah. then through the rest of the uh, operation, all the sabotage and all that, were any was anyone else killed or? Nope. And uh, that's the, you know, and then that's kind of you know, uh, is an interesting perspective and tells you about 
the real danger of these types of operation, operations, it wasn't the attacks themselves, but actually getting in mm -hmm. uh, the logistics uh, of the operation. That was the real uh, challenge. Uh, and to your last question about reprisals, mm -hmm. um, the pattern was that if an operation cost the lives of German soldiers, it, there was a risk of uh, reprisals. Um, after the, uh, because there was an, uh, an uh, attack on January the th uh, 13th, 1945, against the Yeshta Bridge by the Woodlark group that managed to destroy not only a quite large bridge, but it also, uh, because of miscommunications or lack of communication on the German side, side there was a, a troop transport train that crashed into the river uh, a few hours later, mm -hmm. and uh, 78 mm -hmm. People were killed, mm. among them um, um, uh, German soldiers, uh, and there was uh, quite a push from, especially the uh, Reichskommissar Terboven, uh, the the uppermost ger German bureaucrat in Norway. He demanded uh, ten thousand Norwegians from Snosta be executed as reprisals. Um, which was ludicrous because you know there weren't ten thousand people in that community. No, there were only a couple of thousand. But uh, he was uh, his proposal was refused because uh, I think mostly because people in Berlin were not. Um, I mean, many of the the decision makers were facing. Uh, they were facing. Um, uh, you know trials they knew they were going to get uh, you know placed before a, a court for war criminals after the war so um they refused to go ahead with the reprisals knowing that it might come back and bite them after the war uh jeff has a question jeff do you want to ask a question yes uh i'm wondering how did the norwegian resistance Form. I mean, did, they, did just a bunch of Norway, Norway, Norwegians get together and say, we don't want to fight back? Uh, I'm just kind of, I'm actually curious for the more general version of that question. How does any resistance get organized? But how, in particular, how did the Norwegian re resistance get organized? Yeah. And it's, you know, you got to remember that the Norwegian government was intact. They managed to escape to Britain and were able to take command over the resistance. Uh, which meant that Norwegian resistance were more structured and disciplined than, for instance, in France or Yugoslavia or any other place where the resistance movements were, were, were consisted of parts more eager to fight each other than the Germans. So uh, the first kind of um, um, attempts to uh, build a resistance, mo resistance <laughs> movement began shortly after the the German occupied the country, so in the summer and autumn of 1940. But the first attempts were quite, you know, amateur, uh, amateurish, uh, and because, you know, the, there were um, regular military of, uh, army officers uh, trying to keep uh, in touch with their old units, mainly, and that, you know, <laughs> From a security perspective, that was uh, not a very wise thing to do because, you know, the first people the Germans could go knocking uh, on the, the, come looking for it's, you know, it's the leaders of the, the pre-war army. Uh, so you would have, um, uh, over time you will get, uh, and this is the, the, the Norwegian uh, government, uh, sponsored the resistance. They, they were organized into districts and you would have small cells, about five, six, seven men uh, that would know very little about mm. uh, the activities in other cells. So, you know, you, you compare, 
compartmentalize the whole structure so you can so if anybody is captured by the germans you know they can divulge very little from little about uh, the rest of the organization uh or at least that's the you know the ideal of it but you know uh there are especially up into the period uh around 19 uh fall 1942 spring 1943 there are lots of arrests and raids by the germans especially in central norway because you had this rinan gang uh which was uh, uh, a group of Norwegians collaborating with the Germans led by a guy named Henry Oliver Edinon. Mm. And they did uh, what they called, um, actually it was a kind of uh, a German uh, tactic called um, the negative game, they called it. Uh, and the, the, and it, the, it was basically uh, Norwegian collaborators posing as resistance members oh. and they they uh, recruited other Norwegians that genuinely believed that they were working for the resistance and they were sent out to liaison liaison with other resistance groups so and that was that was how they worked in order to, uh, to uh, break up these resistance groups and this uh, was a huge problem in central Norway. So when the Ripa went in, they had uh, that was one of the reasons that the Ripa was forbidden to make contact with the resistance movement because it was basically a uh, a security risk because they didn't know who to trust. Um, and you also see that towards the end of the war, there's a huge raid in uh, Vardal, that's south of Snosa. And there, uh, there's about uh, 30 men fleeing from the Gestapo, joining the Ripa in the final days of the war. Um, yes, and, and then as I mentioned, there was also a communist resistance uh, that cooperated closely with the regular resistance. Uh, they were particularly strong in Northern Norway uh, and uh, especially in groups connected to the railway, because the communists already uh, had strong ties, a strong basis in the uh, in the um, uh, rail government railway railways, and also some in, uh, intellectuals were uh, were on the on the communist uh, um, uh, resistance groups. Um, and but, you know they cooperated, but you know they were kind of a loose. They were kind of loose cannons because they didn't care much about reprisals, and didn't care much about uh, uh, you know um, well, the civilians how their their operations may affect the civilians. So they were, uh, but luckily what they did did was not reflected, uh, or at least the Germans didn't associate what they did with uh, the local population in general, because, you know, it was because they did this kind of saw the communists as a fringe group that, uh, and that the Norwegian civilians didn't have, wasn't responsible for whatever they did. So, mm. yeah, I guess. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One one thing is that sometimes people just sort of um, fell into the resistance. Like uh, one of the persons I know, Knut Knutsen, was a past president of Washington Lodge. He was working, uh, he was a student at the University of Oslo, and he's working in the registrar's office. And he came across a list of names of people that the Germans would want to round up. And he made a copy of that, and he turned it over to the resistance, and uh, which was very valuable. And they, the resistance came back to him and said, you know, you might want to leave Norway, because they figured that the Germans would uh, be able to um, associate the theft of the list with him. So he ended up having to 
go to um, a, a place near Sweden and he sort of skied out of Nor uh, Norway into Sweden and came to the United States and ended up in NIH. But, uh, you know, this whole life was changed by this just one decision to one turn this over yeah. to the uh, uh, resistance. Yeah, you know, one of my friends here in Bellingham, she's 99. She grew up across from Lassevog where the U-boats went in. So she gave me a lot of detail what it was like for her, but her cousin worked with, I don't know if it was the Steen group or another group, they were in the Marine Holman area of Bergen. And they all, they were found out, I think in the summer of uh, 41, uh, the rest continued into 42, but they all knew each other by numbers. They had no, no one knew who was in the group, but about a hundred were arrested. He ended up in Schatzenhausen, and, and his last place was Dachau, and he was never the same. She said mm. that he always had a lot of difficulty uh, when he came back, but uh, it was someone in the group was a Quisling, and they just gave it away. And I always, to me, when I read the early stuff, it sounds like these groups are very organic. Let's go, let's get together and yeah. let's do something. And it's not till later they're getting British advisors and stuff like that. Yeah. And they just didn't understand how ruthless the Germans were. I mean, they were ruthless. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of, you know, uh, and this is my uh, impression also that they just, uh, they were so naive that they just didn't, uh, they, they didn't know the value of keeping things secret. Mm -hmm. uh, Nor Norway never had a uh, security service uh, mm -hmm. before the war, so there, there was not uh, there was there was no culture for it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, and <laughs> you finally you, you you in these documents um, from the Norwe from Norwegian um, SOE groups, you, you always see. Uh, at the bottom, uh, your first duty, duty is silence. And that kind of reflects, uh, I think, many of the mistakes made in the mm -hmm. early periods of the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, and you covered in this book, um, in uh, like his 1930s, uh, the Secretary of State, Henry Simpson, or was later Secretary of Defense, uh, said, uh, canceled all code breaking operations. Because he said, "Gentlemen, do not read gentlemen's mail." Yeah. And I'm just saying, my gosh, is that people were that naive? Yeah, you know, uh, it's how it's, things have changed. You know, things yeah. sometimes say the same, but they do change. Yeah, but but, but where do you draw the line? Yeah, you know, uh, because uh, I think many to, uh, late in late in the post-war year post-war era, I think many feel that the uh, intelligence services may have gone too far. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, technically, uh, and this has been a possibility mm -hmm. for decades, uh, in theory, uh, the NSA can read and listen in on any telephone conversation or read any email sent anywhere in the world, in mm -hmm. theory. No, of course they don't have the capacity or risk to yeah. do it, you know. But uh, the possibilities are there. So mm -hmm. you know, uh, and a lot of people are not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not, but you know. Uh, uh, but and uh, and also through the work in the military, you kind of get. Uh, you, you if you work with intelligence, you very quickly go paranoid mm -hmm. about you know uh you see a ray uh you, if you see a uh a vehicle on the public road with uh large antennas for no reason you get suspicious yeah. <laughs> and you know um and you get some uh, you're briefed on how vulnerable electronic communications are that you're uh, and this you know this is open information so but uh, if you have a um, a TV or a, a com the screen of your computer can actually be uh, read by sensors 
uh, on the distance, you know, in 30, 40 yards, people can, if you have the right equipment, you can see what's on people's uh, computer screens, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, if you, if you only had that possibilities uh, during the Second World War, you know, but, you know, uh, yeah. I, I think we went off topic there, but, uh, you know, Yes. Well, almost thank goodness they didn't. You know, you had DRTs listening in, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think also in the, in America you have uh, uh, you need court orders. Uh, of course, you do in Norway also. That you know, there. Uh, I think you're more uh, your awareness of uh, how this can be uh, abused is much higher than in many other countries in the world. Uh, also in Western countries, for instance, in Britain, you know, you have CCTV uh, cameras on right. every street corner, and you know, uh, I mean, you know, you can question if that's okay, you know. Yeah, but yeah, those are legitimate issues. There's a lot of uh, legitimate issues with, uh, you know, how. Americans might have, uh, United States might have affected elections in countries that might have gone communist in the 70s and 80s, referring to uh, the main subject, one well, of the main subjects of our talk, uh, uh, William yeah. Colby, who was involved in the CIA. And yeah. uh, I think, but, uh, this you know, is something uh, that should, is a complex issue. Yeah. But, you know, uh, the funny thing is that. Uh, Going communist wasn't necessarily a problem as long as they stayed out of the Soviet sphere. For instance, Yugoslavia was communist but allied with the West, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was actually a possibility. And I think also, for instance, the big tragedy about Vietnam was uh, they didn't necessarily, uh, because uh, Ho Chi Minh was actually uh, pro America. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. On the originally, because you know, because he had had dealings with the OSS during the war, Second World War. Uh, so you know, kind of, uh, you can always blame the French, but I think it was <laughs> real possibility that you could let countries go communist but still remain out of the Soviet sphere of influence. You know? That's mm -hmm. right. But Vietnam was. Um very anti-Chinese yeah, and they would not have cozied up to the Chinese in any way, shape or form. And they still are keeping a strong independence from China and also from Russia. And they're just doing their own form of communism and apparently quite happy. Yeah, you know. but it, it's, it's also yeah. very, very interesting when you see US um, foreign relations, how it developed during World War II and until afterwards, because when, as you mentioned, when you came, when it started, the U.S. was still very much into isolationism, and their big challenge was was the British. Fun enough, and even towards the end of the war, you know, there was still this. They were almost more worried about the British, which they saw as a challenge. Which, of course, it's easy to say with hindsight, they were not economically or in any other way able to be that anymore. But even towards the end, you know, they were, uh, Admiral King was very anti-British. Uh -huh. And a lot of the other military, or many of the other military uh, leaders were also, you know, they. I, I'm sure that they had a vision or a feeling that this was, the US was the coming giant. But they still couldn't sort of forget the British. And I think they overlooked the Soviets for a while because, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it must be admitted that uh, I think that the the British were far more negative towards the Americans than the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, you know, um, and I talking about being naive. I think many Americans were uh, naive when they entered the war. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the Soviets, they were, you know, naive when it came to special operations and intelligence. But I can, but as as I imagine, as I mentioned, it was kind of their uh, uh, 
uh, in many ways, it was also to their advantage because, you know, uh, they had a much more open mind towards people mm. than what the British had at the time. Mm. Very interesting. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, just, but just there's so many pieces to the World War II story, even, you know, Norway's, but you get the, the whole uh, Eastern Front. One of the things that just looking at the picture from a large viewpoint is that the Axis powers did not really work very well together. No. Uh, and just to take uh, the key, one of the key factors is the uh, uh, Rush, uh, the German invasion of Russia. Now, if the Germans had been able to capture Moscow, they would have broken the Russian uh, train network. The Russian train market met, met, network yeah. was set up. Everything it's was centered fire. in Moscow. Yeah. If they got Moscow, the Russian train system would have been totally broken. And uh, the Operation Barbarossa was delayed by weeks because of Mussolini and and then had the Japanese entered the war in 41 against Russia there's no way Russia could have survived I mean or very unlikely I hate to say you can predict the, what would have happened but Russia would have been very stressed if they had to fight a two-front war so I mean the fact that these guys really didn't trust each other oh my gosh you can see me and um, which probably is a pretty good bet that they weren't very trustworthy. There, took it off. It was a creepy picture. So, yeah. Uh, Jeff, you have something to say? No, no, just. Okay. No. Yeah. It is, it is, uh, but of course, it is a unique period because never before and hopefully never in the future has pretty much the whole world spent all their resources on fighting each other. I mean, every, yeah, there are a few exceptions we all know, but by and large, every nation of the world devoted, if not all, at least a very large percentage of the resources to build weapons. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's, it's even in for future then, I think it was what it, uh, Pericles said when uh, Sparta and, uh, and Athens were fighting each other to the grounds, basically opening it up for, well, I guess, Alexander in the first step. So he said, future ages will wonder at us, like the present wonders now. And I think we and our next generation will wonder about how the heck could that happen? Yeah. Of crazy, crazy dictators and, you know, 50 million people or whatever died. It's, it's just, mm -hmm. it is incredibly fascinating and of course tragic yeah and that's one of the uh, major challenges challenges uh, because you know for those who don't know i work at the museum and we have a lot of uh, you know school classes uh, on tours and one of the major challenges is you know kind of establish that perspective that you know uh, how the whole, whole, the whole of the society is kind of, you know, geared up for war and how that affects the daily lives of people, for instance, with rationing and stuff. And especially in our days with, you know, uh, credit crunch or no, they, they, I mean, how cheap and available everything is. You can get anything from anywhere around the world if you want it. Uh, but, you know, seeing um shipping lanes get uh, cut seeing uh, things disappear for, to disappear from the grocery store uh, fuel um, uh, supplies dry up you know this whole other world is you know it's very strange and very difficult to you know kind of bridge that gap mm -hmm. Yeah, how much, I mean, the world changed before, but it just seems to be changing a lot faster these days. Yeah. 
you know, generational changes take place in a few years. But. Yeah. We should ask those who were around for the first flights. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. well, well, let's not get too, too nostalgic because uh, I asked my grandmother about that. <laughs> I've been watching this, sorry, a little bit digression, digression but uh, I've been watching one of these big, you know, 60s uh, historical dramas, The Robe and you know, Ben Hur. And I don't remember which one it was. And we lived on the second floor. My grandparents lived on the first floor. And I went down to my grandmother and said, wow, you know, you, you were around so long. You know, all the things you've seen, you know, the first plane, she was born in 1898 or something. Um, first plane and, you know, you got the radio and all these things. And it must have been so exciting back then. She said, no, I never knew, really thought much about it. She said, it just, just like the cell phone, I guess, it just suddenly was there, you used it. But don't believe all this nonsense about the good old days, she said. Those old days were not good. They're only good on movies. <laughs> and, they're, know, they're good because you were young. Go to a bunch of names, you know, I don't remember names, you know, Maria in my class, you know, she, you felt so sorry for her because uh, she, she was from a poor family and always had lice, so they had to shave over hair all the time, which is not great for a young girl, obviously. And then uh, so and so died from consumption. As uh, I mean, so she says, don't believe that it's much better today. And this was in <laughs> Vietnam and so, Vietnam and so on. So, so um, I think it's yeah, if uh, you look at the, if you look at the statistics, you know, fewer and fewer portions of people are die from all kinds of disease. Yeah, right. Per capita, there are less hunger, you know, and so on. So you know, but the impressions are so much stronger because of modern communication so you kind of live with the impression that everything is so bad these days you know but yeah then they're really not just look at new york city new york city is actually one of the safest cities in the u.s or the, or the big cities mm -hmm. but everybody thinks it's for so <laughs> many people you talk to think it's oh it's so much crime and this and that i think it has to do as you said because if somebody kills you in a back street in colorado which has a higher crime ratio than New York. Nobody hears about it. If somebody pushes you out in the subway and you're killed by the train, I murder, there's yeah. 500 cell phones with yeah. photos and you know, you're going to be, you get your 15 minutes right away. That's and that's kind of just, curious. Yeah. I also, uh, if you, in Norwegian media, you can, you get all the time uh, news from America about, you know, traffic accidents Fine. and all kinds of stuff, you know. You just wonder why is this in Norwegian media? You know, it has nothing to do with Norway, and it's really not yeah. that big of a story. You know, but you know, if it happens in the right place and it if it's spectacular enough, it you know it gets into the news everywhere. Yeah, my grandmother was born in eighteen seventy five, so she saw a lot. She lived to be ninety nine, and I asked her once. You know, I thought so romantic. You have you know, a hippy dippy wearing long skirts and all that. She said, no, as soon as the, as the 1920s came in, she took her skirt way out because she said, you know, it was always dragging in the mud when I had to go out and, you know, and uh, chop wood. <laughs> she was a real homesteader going yeah. west, you know, but <laughs> I don't know. I guess we're getting, I guess we're getting creaky or something. <laughs> well, it's not dull. Yeah. Well, we remember the good times, which made good thing. Many good things. So we must be keeping you up late, Frodo. But uh, yeah, yeah I was... uh, actually, I almost midnight. No, it's uh, um, eleven p.m. Okay. Well, anyway, I think this has been a great talk and a great discussion. Yeah. I, uh, we'll be putting parts of this on YouTube as I get time to put these on YouTube. Uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, um, like to thank the audience for their great questions. And uh, again, like to thank you for a great talk and very, um, you know, in depth look at an important part of World War II. So uh, commend you for the work and uh, thank you again for very participating. Glad to and I put in a last plug. It, it, it's one of the best, most interesting books I've read in a while, and I highly recommend it. And it is available on Amazon and hopefully good books 
stores throughout the country. So thank ask you. Ask your library, ask your library for it. You put in a request at your library. Mm -hmm. And since it's being published in the United States, it should be able to get it. But that's one of the best ways to get it in the hands of people. Yeah. Oh, good idea. Any thank other you. comment before we close up? It was a nice Sunday afternoon for us. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you again. So. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bill.